Mr. Speaker, I have often remarked that our generation, this generation of Guyanese, is the most fortunate of Guyanese in our country's history. We have a history, sir, of poverty. We have a history of impoverishment and underdevelopment. It is the first time in the history of our country that we have a real opportunity of living the quality of life that we deserve. This piece of legislation, sir, is indeed historic and it is intended to be part of a network that is designed to ensure that every single Guyanese benefit from our multi-billion oil and gas sector. And therefore, sir, it behoves every single member of this House to support this bill. Now, I have heard the question of com consultation. Sir, first of all, the Honourable Member, Mr. Patterson, when one listened to him, one not being aware of the history, would have thought that Mr. Patterson, when he was in government, had passed a most comprehensive piece of local content legislation. In the Attorney General Chambers, there was not even a draft. Not even a draft. We have put, sir, to this House a comprehensive bill, and it was not an easy task to put pen to paper in relation to this bill. As the Honorable Subject Minister said, we are dealing with a brand new sector, highly technical, highly sophisticated, highly complex, and also we are dealing for the first time with the question of assessing our capacity, local capacity, in an area that we have absolutely no experience. And yet, we are criticized simply for a schedule that we have made clear will vest, the minister is empowered with the discretionary elasticity to change that schedule whenever we see that we have the capacity. My friends understanding, I say this with the greatest of respect, my friend's understanding of the legal service that, re that is required for this sector, I dare say, is quite simplistic. Quite simplistic. 90%, Mr. Speaker, I don't think my friend ever saw one of these contracts or one of the joint venture arrangement or the other technical legal documents that have to be executed in this sector. And perhaps that is why he made the comments that he made. Mr. Speaker, this bill, as we have repeatedly said, is a work in progress. It is not the end all. And that is why we have that schedule. And that schedule has that ministerial discretion. And we will change it. The Honorable Member speaks about getting a, ensuring that Exxon got a local contractor to build the building. Why did he allow the building to be built in the first place? If you're talking about local content. Why allow the building to be built and owned by Exxon? He doesn't answer that question. He's dealing with the contractor. That kind of nitpicking, sir, is totally unwarranted in this very important exercise of local content. Mr. Speaker, first of all, we, ha we have a definition of who is a Guyanese company and who is a Guyanese citizen. Guyanese citizen is defined by our constitution and by the Citizenship Act. My friend wants us to limit Guyanese citizenship to birth only. That is only one aspect or one way by which you get citizenship. You have citizenship by marriage. You have citizenship by naturalization. You have citizenship by descent. This kind of myopic 
recommendation that he's making is highly discriminatory. And yet he speaks about discrimination within the Treaty of Shagaramas, but doesn't recognize that he's discriminating against Guyanese in violation of our fundamental rights and freedoms. In Guyana. That is the kind of presentation that's completely lacking of competence and substance. Trinidad has had a local content policy for over 40 years. It never ran afoul of the Treaty of Shagaramas. Suriname has local content. They are part of the, the common market and the common economy. There's no issue of, of, of local of violation with the Treaty of Shagaramas. We looked at Nor Norway was part of the European Union. There was no conflict there. We looked at Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, uh, Ghana, they are all, they are, they are African organizations similar to that of CARICOM. There was no conflict with those legislation. It's not that we didn't address our minds to this, sir. We have addressed our minds to it, and when the issue arises, we will deal with it. We will deal with it. So, you have the government's assurance that we have addressed that issue, and we will deal with it at the appropriate time. Sir, the other point that the, the, the honorable member made is that sole trader. He says that bi uh, businessmen operating under a trade name or a business registration name is not caught by the definition. Again, that is a highly simplistic understanding of the definition. A sole, the name, the business name is simply the name under which you trade, or the style under which you trade. The human being behind the business is a human being, a sole trader, a private individual. That person must be a Guyanese citizen. We included partnership because you have law firms that are partners, you have accountants that are partners, and they may not have been covered by the definition we have for companies. We have addressed that. Only last night, sir, only last night, you're talking about consultation. Let me deal with that. As the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources said, we had an entire year of consultation by a team established by His Excellency the President. Then we imported a high-level team. We invited a high-level team from Ghana with whom we held a series of consultations. We had also, sir, uh, a professor from Ghana with whom we consulted. Then we met with the sector. We met with every single major organization or business interest in Guyana, the insurance sector, the bar association, the, the, the uh, manufacturing sector, the contractors, the accountants, the insurance people, every single sector we met with and took their recommendations on board. We didn't have to actually meet them. They wrote us. My Lord, my, the Honorable Member is speaking about we didn't consult with them. Those people wrote us why you didn't write. Why you didn't write? The bill took a very long time to be completed after several iterations and after several rounds of consultation. I was just making the point that only last night, only last night late, we took on board several recommendations from the accountants and the insurance company. And that is how we raised the threshold in those two sectors. And we made some other adjustments. Last night late also, we were working until one o'clock this morning on his amendments, which he tabled, he sent to us on the 28th of December. Or, 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 28, only yesterday he sent it. And yet, we took it on board. And out of about 14, we have incorporated about 12. And there's no gratitude, no recognition. And the, the Honorable Member speaks about an appeal tribunal. He wants, he believes, and he says he calls Mr. the Honorable Member Mahi Paul. According to him, Mahi Paul will turn up with his Guyanese passport to be registered at the local register, and for some reason, they will chase him. That was the analogy that he gave. Sir, this is the kind of debate that we are having in the House. And then he wants an appeal a tribunal to which Mahi Paul can go and appeal. Now, when we incorporate into the law 
a definition of who is a Guyanese or who is a Guyanese company, and there is any violation of that law, the aggrieved citizen has recourse to the courts. That is how democracy works. We want a tribunal in there to perform legal functions. That tribunal may very well be accused of trespassing upon the separation of powers because that tribunal will be determining a matter of law. Issues of law are to be determined by the judiciary. And we have judicial review, and we have a constitutional court, and we have a, 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 a civil court that will deal with these issues. So we set up a tribunal according to him. When a person is aggrieved by that decision of that tribunal, where does it go? You continue to build an alternate court system, you still have to go back to the court. So that argument of, of the honorable member must be rejected out of hand. It makes no sense. Sir, so let me get to the bill itself. We were very careful here. The honorable member speaks about family and friends. I don't know which bill he has read. This bill speaks to competitive bidding in a public procurement process. Right through the bill speaks about that. I don't know how in that statutory matrix one can dole out contracts to friends and family the way he did the Harbor Bridge contract for $160 million, carry to cabinet and get the Harbor Bridge to pay. That is doling out to friends and family. That is corruption. We don't do that in this government. We have legislated a public procurement process in the act that all, all contractors, all licensees, and all operators in the sector must comply with. They only go to get sole sourcing with the permission of the minister, and they have to satisfy very specified and specific grounds before they can get sole sourcing. They cannot get sole sourcing once the service or the skill is available in Guyana. That is the kind of framework that is in this bill to protect our local people and our local industry and company. And Mr. Speaker, I don't know which organizations he consulted, because we consulted right across the board, and we have the full support of every major organization in this country. Now, granted, everyone believes that they can do 100%. Everyone believes that. Any sector you go to, you speak to the lawyers, they believe they can do 100%. You go to the doctors, you, they believe they can do 100%. You go to the accountants, they can do 100%. But as a government, we have to assess the sector. We have to ensure that the sector works. And that is why we have added that kind of discretion in the minister to change it by order, not by amendment. So we don't have to come through any protracted legal and statutory process to get these schedules amended. Once we have the capacity, once we have the capacity, we are going to change it. We have the local people at heart. This is our bill. You did nothing. So don't come and accuse us of, of shortchanging locals here where you did nothing for them in the form of a legislation. Nothing. Every Guyanese is aware of what is taking place in this country. The private sector in our consultations with them, they said that they begged you all for about three years to pass this bill because of what was taking place right across the length and breadth of Guyana with foreigners coming into the country and invading, taking over the sector buying lands, all the river lands on the East Bank, taking over the contracting services, bringing in the heavy duty equipment to the exclusion of Guyanese. We responded to that. We were alive to those, uh, those atrocities and those are being addressed in this bill. My friend spoke about, the honorable member spoke about the Institute of Business Development, which is an institute established by the oil company. You want to hear about, about um, incest? Speak to the private sector. We spoke with them and they detailed to us the litany of stories of discrimination, of, of, of neglect, of how they were ostracized from getting a fair opportunity to participate in that same organization that you are speaking about. We spoke to the people, the aggrieved parties, and that is what they told us. So yes, this Secretariat will 
I don't know if to replace, that's not our organization, but this is an apparatus of the state, the Secretariat. And this will assume the state's responsibility of ensuring that that register is maintained and every Guyanese who have an opportunity, who want to participate in the industry is recorded in that register. And the register will be made public. And most importantly also, we did not make it mandatory for every Guyanese to go on the register. You going on the register is optional, but if you make the decision not to go on the register, then your services will not be counted as local content, as local content. The other issue that the honorable member raised is about, um, is, I can't remember, but, uh, <laughs> So, so, Mr. Speaker, this bill speaks about the two plans, the master plan and the annual plan. And inherent in those plans is an obligation for the oil sector as well as the state to continuously build capacity so that we will continue to build the type of capacity that is required for the sector so at some point in time, at some point in time, hopefully, we will be completely self-sufficient in the sector. But until then, we have to leave that window of opportunity. Oh, my friend was speaking about fixed storm contracts. Now, this bill, the way it is structured, allows, Mr. Speaker, all, first of all, all existing contracts will not be interfered with because we respect the sanctity of contract. That is a very important a principle that we embrace as a government. So all existing contracts will not be affected by the schedule. And there is a one year period, a one year period that the schedule will take their full force. And once that happens, Mr. Speaker, then the, the machinery begins and the, the, the Secretariat will begin to do its work. Mr. Speaker, we, we didn't draft this bill in a vacuum. We looked at Trinidad and Tobago. We looked at Ghana. We looked at Nigeria. We looked at Uganda. We looked at Sierra Leone. And we looked at Norway and best practices learned from those jurisdictions. And we tried as far as possible to incorporate them into this bill. And what we have here is perhaps, Mr. Speaker, in the opinion of the, at least the Ghanaians, they said that we have one of the best bills that they have seen in this part of the world. Mr. Speaker, we also had to deal with the question of how you treat with an activity because the bill speaks to petroleum operations for Guyana, for Guyana. So you have to address your minds, for example, to an activity, a company here operating within Guyana, but has to carry out a contract or build some type of equipment in Singapore. And you have to deal with those kinds of complex issues. Do you impose in that instance do you impose local content? Would that construction taking place in Singapore to be used in Guyana for an operator in Guyana be considered local content? So these are very complex issues that we had to spend a long time to address to find a workable solution. I would be the first and we would be the first to say that we don't pretend that this is a perfect bill, but it is the best First opportunity, I think, that we could have put forward. And every single Guyanese, their interest was protected in the paramount consideration in this bill to ensure that Guyana and Guyanese benefit in a most maximum way from the operations here. We had a long discourse, for example, with the insurance people because we know that the insurance sector in Guyana can't really 
deal with it, the, the mammoth nature of the insurable interests that are associated with this sector. But we took guidance from the Insurance Act that says that all risks that originate in Guyana must be insured in Guyana. And it is guidance from that act that caused us to raise that threshold to 100%. Then you have the bankers may be aggrieved, they may not be satisfied because they believe that they can produce, they can provide all the services, but they can't. You are talking about a multi-billion dollar industry. Our banking sector simply can't. But if you ask them, they will tell you yes. And that is the kind of balance one has to strike in a government because you want the sector to work. We spend a lot of time, for example, in, in relation to accommodation, hotels in particular. Do we put 100% local hotels? We decided not to. In fact, we decided to leave out hotels simply because we have in the pipeline about eight or nine five-star hotels, branded hotels that are scheduled to come here. If they see that we put 100% hotel accommodation for any local content bill, that is the end of the exercise. They will not invest here. We want those investments. Later on, later on we can change. But we have to be alive to all these realities, all these competing interests, all these vicissitudes, and craft a bill that strikes a delicate balance to ensure that we have a workable bill and a workable framework. This was not a fly-by-night effort, Mr. Speaker. It was not a fly-by-night effort. And I, we took, for example, my friend spoke a lot about his contributions and about his amendments. You know what the amendments were? One of them, he wanted a change, a name. Change Interagency Committee to Local Content Oversight Committee. How profound. How profound. And you hear his mouth just now. As though he had some odd shattering. So we accepted it. In my view, it makes no difference. But importantly, we accepted a recommendation from him to expand the agency. And we have included organizations like the National Tushau Council. We have included the Guyana Bar Association. We have included a nominee from the parliamentary opposition. And we have included representative from the local petroleum organization. What, what is, no, I, I agree. Apart from the name change, the deep poll. He wanted a deep poll. But this is substantive and we have accepted this. We have accepted it. Then the other one is, oh, <laughs> the vice, you want the vice chairman of the committee to be elected. Well, that's neither here nor there. We accepted that. And he had some other consequential changes, which we have accepted. Um, the, the definition, let me go back to the definition of a company. We said 51% of shares, but we didn't leave it there. 51% of the shares can also mean that you don't have the requisite voting power. We included that. We included that. We have embraced the concept of beneficial owner, ownership, to ensure that we get the, the real owners. And then, of course, we had the, the management of the company also, because we recognize that you can have 51% shares, but you don't run the company. We put a percentage of the management. And then the non-skilled labor force, we have a very, very high percentage to ensure that Guyanese predominate, that Guyanese predominate. One organization wanted us to draw a distinction between local content and national content. The reason being that they wanted to exclude Guyanese who are not living in Guyana. On what basis should we do that? On what basis should we tell a Guyanese living in the diaspora that he can't come and partake and participate in business opportunities in Guyana? We can't manage a country with those kinds of discriminatory streaks. We can't. And that is why we are rejected out of hand. 
his suggestion that the, um, we, we confine citizenship to birth. How can we do that? When you can acquire citizenship under the Citizenship Act by way of naturalization, or you can get it by way of marriage, or you can get it by way of descent. If one of your parents is a Guyanese, you are entitled to be registered as a Guyanese. Under the, the Constitution and the laws of the country says that. You can't violate the Constitution with an ordinary law. Mr. Ramjatan will advise him. So, Mr. Speaker, the, we couldn't accept those aspects of what he proposed. And I heard him, I thought, I heard him make a number of um, criticisms of the bill. I thought that the paper that he shared with us constituted what his contributions are to the bill. But he had some fresh thoughts this morning because half of the things that he said there are not part of his proposals. They are not part of his proposals. So we couldn't have looked at them. And this morning, I heard him make a big issue. <laughs> they agreed, Mr. Speaker. Last night, they agreed to meet with us in the National Assembly in that room to have a discussion. And we were, we were prepared to allow him, to allow them to ta table their own amendments. We were prepared to allow them to do that, to give you a real opportunity. You didn't even turn up to the meeting. You did not even turn up to the meeting and then come here and measuring seconds. Measuring seconds and minutes and hours. When only last night you sent us your proposals. Only last night you sent us your proposals. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill, I don't, I don't intend to go clause by clause into the bill, but this bill captures all the important tenets to make local content work in Guyana. We, as I said, this is our first attempt at it. We have, oh, and then uh, let, me, let me speak about the transparent nature. All the reports, the annual plan, the, the five-year plan, are all going to be made public so that Guyanese can see what are the plans of these companies and can start to build capacity. We have in the act, of course, in the bill that we will exclude confidential information and proprietary information. But other than those two exceptions, every component of those plans will be made public and guides can pull them down from the website or obtain a copy from the ministry and study them and start to work to build capacity. Also, the local content register will also be publicized. It's a public document, so you know who are on the local content register. It's not no hide and seek game. Everyone who is there, you, you, you are there and your capacity is stated or your skill is stated or the services that you are offering would be documented on that local content register. And that would be available across the globe for every guy who is living wherever to have a look at that document. And fair opportunity is given for you to register. The Secretariat, Mr. Speaker, is going to be a very, very important institution. It is the Secretariat that will manage this bill when it becomes law. And the Secretariat will act only upon the policy directions of the Minister. In fact, the draft that the consultant had produced to us had a preponderance of power located in the Minister. We removed that and we put it into the Secretariat. A Secretariat that would be staffed by technical people. Technical people. And they would be running the show, basically under the general supervisory direction of the subject minister. There is no other way to do it. There is no other way to do it. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill here, I see a whole long list of speakers. 
What is there to speak on this bill other than to laud it? What is there to speak about this bill other than to laud it? Somebody will come here and speak about trucking service again. We have addressed that. If we have the trucking service, we will change that tomorrow. We did an assessment of the sectors. We, we talked to the people who are providing the services. They don't have the capacity now. They will get it. When they get it, we will change it. Somebody call a contractor name from Trinidad. That contractor has capacity. And he has built-in contracts already. It's not that we are oblivious to these realities. We spend days and days talking about these things, discussing them with the various sectors, and understanding what capacity they have, what they can provide. We had to bring their expectations down to acceptable levels too. It was not an easy exercise, because as I said, every sector believes that they can, they can, they can provide 100%. And you know, what? you know what is the oil sector's position? They want no local content. They want no local content. They want freedom to reign. They want freedom to reign. They don't want local content. So you have two extremities. You have a local sector that wants 100%. Then you have the sector itself who wants no lo local content. You have to bridge that gap in an intelligent way, in a fair and equitable way. And that is what we have done in this, in this bill, Mr. Speaker. As I said, it's our first attempt at it, and we are going to constantly improve it, and we have put in it built-in mechanism to give the minister fluidity and flexibility in adjusting the schedules when we think that we have the capacity. There is nothing sinister. There is nothing um, uh, sinister. There is nothing ill motive about this bill. This bill represents the conscience of this country. This bill protects Guyanese, and every single Guyanese, as far as I am aware, every single Guyanese is proud of this bill. Mr. Speaker, I commend this bill to the National Assembly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Attorney General. Honorable members, this is...